Our next speaker is Rose McDermott. She's the David and Mariana Fisher University Professor of International Relations at Brown University. And she is talking about the biology of trust and its influence on science politics. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here and to have a chance to talk a little bit about this. After the last talk, I feel like this is a little bit like Monty Python now for something you know completely different. Um, although I do think that it builds on a lot of the themes that um, seem to have been bubbling up today, both around um, trust and the flip side of trust, which is, um, you know, of course, betrayal. Um, so my work these days actually is a lot to do with um, political behavior genetics and looking at the heritable aspects of political ideology. So. Um, uh, this is not actually going to be mostly about genetics, though. My discussion will really be more on hormones and peptides and how they relate to it, but also the intersection of that with um, the politics of thinking about science. And so um, that's what I wanted to talk about that. Uh, as I mentioned, some of these themes have come up earlier today as we've been talking um, about the disconnection between science and the belief in science, right? So if we're talking about trust, it's not just trust, but it's whether or not we actually believe in um, the various things that we're talking about. And there's numerous factors that go into it. Um, at lunch, I was actually talking to Erica a bit about you know, how belief in science and, and um, uh, what, what's true and what's not actually has a, you know, an undergirding in political ideology. And this has been coming up around um, climate change in particular this morning. But there's obviously other contributing factors to it where people on the political right and people on the political left can have very different beliefs about what science is. Um, but not just what science is, but what its useful and proper function is within broader society. Um, and that can affect not only our belief in whether or not science is true, but also what place we put science in, in our hierarchy of values. Um, because people can have different values and privilege different things. So that for some people, you know, um, truth and science can be the most important thing. But for other people, um, other kinds of beliefs, whether they're political beliefs or religious beliefs, have a primacy over those other values. Um, and that's, in fact, one of the other contributing factors can be religious beliefs that affect our notion of science, especially when um, the lessons or you know, truth value of science may conflict with particular ideological beliefs. And, you know, I thought um, Phyllis was very eloquent um, about the ways that that can integrate, but in many ways it also can be disassociated in Western societies that, you know, um, this, is, this is religion and this is, you know, science and um, the sort of the two don't mix. Um, and obviously we have cultural factors and um, educational differences that affect um, our understanding of the difference between science and our belief in science. Um, and I think at root, this, th these contributing factors really um, revolve around a disconnect or a ju juxtaposition between those who really believe that um, science represents um, something positive. It's progress. Um, it brings positive change. It's something that's going to be good. It's going to cure cancer. It's going to do all these wonderful things. And those who believe that actually science is bad um, and that there's ways that um, science actually contributes to feelings of fear and anxiety about the things we don't know and the things we can't know um, and its function for um, whether or not science itself can reduce that sense of fear or actually um, um, exacerbate it. So um, when we talk about the biology of trust, um, I think that the standard notion um, is to think about it in terms of oxytocin. That's been the stuff that's really been out there in the popular press, in particular about um, the role of the underlying um, function of oxytocin in producing trust. And um, because it's been out there in the public, pop, popular press, I want to talk about it a little. But in fact, um, it's much more complicated than that, as we've been um, discussing throughout the day. And I want to be um, quite humble, both in the presentation of this, but also um, in explicitly recognizing that this is only one of many, many, many biological contributions to a very complex uh, outcome. But I think it's worth discussing. Um, Oxytocin is actually the, one of the first peptides, um, neuropeptides, and, and um, 
uh, hormones to be um, discovered. It was discovered in 1906 um, for its contribution to uterine contractions because oxytocin is really about uh, childbearing and um, lactation in particular. It was first synthesized in 1955 by um, De Vinograd, who won the Nobel for that work. Um, and it was mostly through, throughout um, scientific history understood for its contribution to reproduction, not only childbearing and lactation, but um, contributing to aspects of parental care and other kinds of social bonding. Um, and as, as um, a notion of how we think about um, these roles of social bonding, it's been seen as a precursor to trust. Um, a lot of the experimental work on oxytocin has actually been done by an economist, um, Ernst Fair in Switzerland, um, where his um, um, they have less restrictions around IRB in terms of, of being able to administer it in um, uh, experimental work. And they've been looking at it um, for the contribution that oxytocin has to um, economic games. So how it is that if you trust someone, you're more likely to engage in financial interactions with them. You're more likely to um, you know, replicate money given to you in a trust game or an ultimatum game so that you can have um, um, more cooperative financial decision making. So it's seen as a sort of um, positive thing. And in fact, that work has shown that um, with higher rates of oxytocin, whether administered externally or um, there's been some work that Paul Zak has done with endogenous uh, arousal using basically um, um, back massages to get people to raise their endogenous level of oxytocin. Um, it shows that people are much more willing to bear all kinds of risks in social interactions, um, not just financial ones. So the work, as I said, um, began with some of this work in economics, but really um, has expanded also out into uh, work in psychology, looking at people with um, higher, again, endogenous or externally um, imposed notion, um, uh, rates of oxytocin, um, being more willing to share secrets with other people, which may not always be a good thing for um, uh, those of you who uh, uh, know of some of the scandals on Facebook and so on, um, but also um, being able to read emotions, particularly emotions in each other's eyes. All right, so the reason this has been of particular interest is those who want to look for novel treatments for um, things like autism. Um, now, in trying to interrogate how oxytocin actually does this, like how is it that it um, allows people to increase risk in social interactions, um, there have been various tests of it, but basically what happens is people are just more willing to accept betrayal over many, many iterations if you have higher levels of oxytocin. So with people, you know, who are playing a various game and they don't have the higher levels, if you betray them, you know, it's a tit for tat. You betray them once, they're not going to trust you the next time. What happens with people who have these higher rates is you can betray them again and again and again and again and again and they keep coming back for more, right? Um, and they're willing to engage in cooperation even after they've been betrayed. Um, and so again, there have been a lot of um, uh, MRI studies that have looked at how and why this happens. It appears to um, have to do with reduced uh, activation in the part of the brain, the amygdala, which relates to emotions. And the reason it's critical is because in a minute we're going to talk about fear, which I think is related to some of the discussion that we've been having about risk taking and who is willing to um, take risks. Carrie um, talked about some of that data this morning. Um, and I think that fear is the piece that's undergirding um, the, the risk-taking capacity that um, we've been talking about. Now, these are not simple phenomenon. They're very complex. Um, some of the work has been done with animals, but I think it's important to remember that in all of these um, um, discussions, there is variance across people, but also variance across contexts. All right. So there's an element, again, um, genetic, where trust appears to have a heritable element. Some people are, by disposition, more trusting than others. Um, but it appears to vary with subtypes of polymorphisms on different kinds of um, uh, aspects of the oxytocin receptor. Um, and that what's really, in many cases, happening is that there's, for those people who have variants that make them more trusting, and more empathic, they're also more susceptible to negative social stressors, right? So more empathic people are also more sensitive to rejection. These things happen together. So it's not that you get an altogether unmitigated positive, but there's also other consequences. So if we think about this in mental health terms, you may make somebody more cooperative, more trusting, but you may also be making them more susceptible to depression and anxiety, right? These things are not uh, independent. Okay. 
So as I mentioned, the flip side of trust is betrayal. Um, and when we talk about biology, part of why I didn't want to just talk about oxytocin is that there are other human universals. And as somebody who um, studies evolutionary psychology, which is what I do, you know, some of the mechanisms that we look at are not just about uh, human universals in terms of hormones or genetics or those kinds of contributions, but also broader and more complex psychological processes. And one of them is that we as a human being, are, human beings are quite good at cheater detection because our survival has really been potentiated by being able to figure out people who are trying to take advantage of us and cheat from us. We're really good at detecting um, people who are, um, uh, you know, sort of giving us a, a load of untruth. Um, it's how we process information. It's how we screen information. Um, how we impose certainty where there's uncertainty. And so part of the issue with um, trying to convince people to trust science or to trust the broader scientific process is that we have very well-developed psychological mechanisms for detecting those who are trying to lie to us and to cheat us. And that recognition has been very important for our um, survival as a species. Um, and I think that it speaks to you know, some of the issues that we've been talking about earlier today, not just in terms of um, past issues of betrayal, but how it is that we try to um, see the positive side when we as a species are also much more sensitive to negative information and negative feedback. So we talk about trust like it's an all good thing, right? Like we should all trust everybody, but in fact, we shouldn't. There's lots of people who are out to take advantage of us financially and otherwise. Um, and that oftentimes we're, um, we don't trust information that we're given because many of the cues that are associated with that information, particularly things like financial incentives, uh, indicate that when information is untrustworthy. That's our cheater detection. We say, gee, if somebody has something to get out of this, maybe I shouldn't believe what they're saying. Um, because they have a reason for saying it that may not be about what's good for me or what's true. Um, and so we have these institutional and structural barriers which are designed to protect us but in fact may take advantage of us, right? And we can get manipulated and cheated by that. And we've been talking about a number of those things um, this morning and today and, and I think a couple of them are worth reiterating. I mean, as sort of um, Tim went over an awful lot of this this morning and had some great examples of it. But the public knows that profits derive to those who develop products, particularly pharmaceutical companies, right? We have our notions about pharmaceutical companies and well, if they're gonna make a lot of money off that vaccine, then maybe you know it's not really about protecting me, it's really about their making profit. But the public also knows that the academics have certain incentives that may be different than financial incentives but are no less powerful around status, around prestige, around promotion, around tenure, around other kinds of reinforcements, funding, that really matter to them that also may skew their understanding um, of the believability of certain kinds of results. Okay, so what do we do with all this? And I think it's complicated, as we've been talking about. Um, we have these tendencies, they're not going to go away, right? Tendencies around cheater detection are not going to go away. Um, and they're useful. We have to see the value in them. Um, some of what we've been talking about, I think, is true. Um, education, not just the content of education, like here is this information about oxytocin, but Here's this information about how, how science is done. How is an experiment conducted? How do you know um, the difference between a control condition and a treatment condition, right? Because one of the things that I think um, uh, the pressure to get things out first means that um, the public often believes that a single experiment is definitive. We're not very good at telling people, actually, a single experiment can't tell you very much at all. Right? It, it helps you a little bit around hypothesis development, but you need to do replications to understand the scope, to understand the generalizability, to understand the ways in which your findings may or may not apply to different populations by race, by gender, by whatever it is. We're not very good at conveying that information because the important piece is that we got there first. Um, so we need to explain what clinical trials are um, to get populations to invest in them. I think. Um, the issues that Marsha brought up today about having people invest in those trials and also be able to control them. Um, and um, some of the procedures that Phyllis was talking about I think are relevant here. But also what you can know from the studies. I mean, um, 
I thought Tim had great examples this morning about chocolate is good, eggs are good, you know, bacon is bad. I mean, you know, for 10 years you weren't supposed to eat any fat and now you're not supposed to eat any carbohydrate. And if you really read all the paper, you shouldn't read anything at all, but then that would probably kill you too. And so, you know, you're left with like, what do you do? Um, so part of the issue is also communication issue, right? Every time we put information out there that overturns past work, we erode trust. So we have this notion, well, you know, fat's bad for you, and now fat isn't so bad for you. So we have to think seriously in the ways that Kirk was talking about today about how do you communicate stuff and that when you mess up, fess up, right? I mean, you sort of see these examples where companies make big mistakes, like Tylenol, and they come out and they say, wow, we made a mistake, we're gonna do a recall, we're gonna do this incredibly expensive thing, we're gonna take all our drugs back in, we're gonna make it right, we're gonna apologize, and then people forgive you and you can move on versus something like Toyota where they're like hiding all the information and then stuff dribbles and drabs, there isn't really an apology because they don't wanna be legally responsible, they don't really fix it, and so you have, um, an eroding of trust. And then I think it's very important that we recognize the cultural and religious factors that compete with science for privilege of values. And we can deride this, right? We can say that those things shouldn't matter, but that doesn't mean that they don't matter and that they won't influence people's choices about the values that they'll privilege. So they can say, I can believe your studies, but I just, I'm not gonna act on them because it's more important to me um, to remain consistent with my belief structures and with my cultural and religious values. Um, and finally, you know, I think that if we really want the public to trust science, we have to create a scientific system that is worthy of trust. Um, and then Carrie showed this morning that one of the ways that you do that is to have a healthcare system that's publicly as opposed to privately funded, and to have academic systems where we can trust where what's rewarded is not the outcome, how fast somebody is, or you know how. Um, uh, sexy a particular result is, but the actual study itself, right? The quality of the experimental design and the protocol and to actually sh begin to shift our values about what's important in science, not the outcome, but the actual process. Um, so that's kind of my end point. If you want people to trust science, you need to work harder to make science trustworthy because we have systems that will detect those who are trying to lie to us and manipulate us and um, make things not valuable. So uh, I'm gonna stop there and then leave some time for questions. No questions? <laughs> How would a scientist go about um, initiating communication to say to without saying, "Yeah, my science is trustworthy," or, or is that what we should say? Um, I think that we can convey things about the quality of our design. So. Like, for example, a lot of the, um, there was recently, the example I'm thinking of is a study that was done with MRIs that looked at, you know, whether conservative brains and liberal brains were different. And, um, you know, it was one of these, we'll get the study out first, and it has beautiful brain pictures, and everybody thinks they're sexy. And then there was a group of neuroscientists, 30 really well-respected scientists, who wrote an article in the New York Times saying, this is not quality research, you know. The number of subjects is really low. The threshold for significance was inappropriate and not up to the cultural standard. And so I think that there's ways in which um, those kinds of conversations are important. And I've seen it actually around this Dr. Oz thing of late, like the head of the Columbia Medical School came out yesterday and wrote a letter, a public letter where he said, Dr. Oz can't have it both ways. He cannot have scientific credibility and public acclaim um, and expect to have scientific cre credibility while um, giving up the values of science. And so pick your poison. You know, you either have to s live with the rigors of science and so be careful about what you say or have this public um, dimension where you're sort of sl slick and sloppy, but then you're not gonna get the scientific credibility. And I thought that was a really powerful statement because he was trying to safeguard, um, and this was his own institution, right? I mean, trying to safeguard the integrity of the scientific process. And so for me, a lot of that is about 
um, talking about the process as opposed to the outcome. So it's not that you have to trust my results. You have to trust the procedure along which I did it. And that I'm willing to say when I make mistakes or to say the limits of my work, that it's like, OK, you know, there's some stuff on oxytocin. It's complicated. It's more, um, you know, there's more to be learned. Um, some of these studies are better than others, but not to just present it like, here's the be all and end all. Um, Hi, Rose. Phyllis Nassi, Huntsman Cancer Institute. So if we're supposed to trust the science and the process, we still have the problem with the scientist. Yeah. And we have a problem with the fact that we really don't do anything to um, charge ourselves as scientists with those scientists that violate mm -hmm. the process. And you can do, you know, you can, you can make bad choices, get away with it, get punished, be forced to leave your university and go to another one and start all over again. Mm -hmm. So what really have we accomplished? And why do we do that as scientists? We just sort of, you know, take you down a rung, throw you out to go someplace else. Well, and I think that that's one of um, the greatest challenges um, is that we're not very good at policing ourselves. And that the way that we as scientists police ourselves is so conflated with competition that it's very difficult to know um, if I'm trying to take you down because you do bad science or I'm trying to take you down because you're doing what I'm doing and I want the acclaim and not you. And you can see in some of these noteworthy cases of scientists who've been accused of academic fraud, steeple in the Netherlands being the most um, probably notorious example, but there have been tons of them where it, it really goes to the issue that Jim was saying earlier about malevolence. It's not just that the person made a mistake, but that it was intentional. And we have these IRBs, but I feel like IRBs are about, you know, covering the ass of the institution. Absolutely. You know, financially and legally. They're not about what's right. Um, and we don't have a good standard of ethics that across disciplines scientists buy into. And we don't have a good system of, you know, for lack of a better term, criminal justice around ethical violations of scientists. I don't think we're very good about policing that, and I think developing that kind of system of ethics is really critical because there are precisely the kind of violations you're mentioning now, but that you also, you know, spoke to so eloquently in your earlier talk. Um, I consider it a really big challenge now because the peer review system is so broken. Um, I've seen so many cases of peer review where papers get rejected because I'm working on the same thing and so it's going to get sent to me because I'm the expert but then you know those are exactly the people who are trying to torpedo your work or they'll delay it so that they can steal the idea and do it first. I mean um, there's a lot of ways in which uh, transparency is used to manipulate the system rather than to actually um, improve the quality of it and I'm deeply concerned about all of those and I, I would think that one of the goals for me out of a program like this and the ones that might follow is to try and develop an ethical system that we sign on to. But do you think lately when the World Health Organization said that all science should be transparent and all everything should be published, failures, those that didn't make it, everything is out in the open now, will help do that? Well, there's or help, help us police ourselves? Yeah, I think there's two parts of it. I do think um, it's really important to publish null results for two reasons. One is I think too much work gets replicated because people don't know that somebody else did it and it didn't work. And so there's a lot of time and money that, that, that gets wasted. I do have some ethical issues with like, all information should be immediately made available. I also work in a field where there's a lot of qualitative work, including interviews. I would not want identifying information to be made public because those lives of those people can be really affected, not only because it may be associated with genetic information that may say they have certain diseases, but you know, in some of the work that I have colleagues do in the Middle East, their lives are at risk. You know, they could, you know, if they were known, they could get killed. And so, you know, I have, I don't think that everything, you know, right away is necessarily what we want, but I do think that it is important to. Um, uh, you know, have null, have journals, you know, the journal of null findings, right? So that, that people are aware of what has been done that has failed. Thank you. That's a good yeah. idea, the journal of null findings. <laughs>
Rick Borschel, Department of Energy, Office of Science. So I'm anticipating a little bit some of our conversations tomorrow around some of the scenarios and, and, and how we activate what you've told us today in those conversations. And I'm thinking back to what are some examples that you could give us of uh, effective triggers of cheater detection. So that what, what, what flags that for us? And I'm thinking in particular, you know, for the last, oh, six or eight, ten years, we've been pushing in many federal agencies about just how closely connected we are with industry and how we're just, our funding, you know, we were spinning up all these great industrial applications. And I'm thinking, is that a cheater detection trigger? Yeah. Um, I think that's a good point, and I think that um, certainly one of the cheater detections is this piece about incentives, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It can be things like status. But if you know that something... So some part of it is if you tell people about a conflict of interest and you say, okay, people now have to disclose their financial uh, investments in a company that they're creating a drug for or um, you know, that they have to declare um, other kinds of conflicts of interest in the work that they do, that's helpful. I think it's necessary but not sufficient. Um, the other pieces around cheater detection that I think our important cues are things about probability, you know, like does it pass the smell test? Like if somebody says, you know, this is 100% likely, well, very, very few things are 100% likely. And so I'm going to start wondering, why are you trying to sell me the story? Um, and things that um, also appear to be um, what I think of as ecologically invalid. You just would not expect that thing to occur in that environment. Um, and so um, those are the things where I think people start to be skeptical, um, where it's too likely or um, it shouldn't appear in that environment. Um, and those are, the, those are the things I think of as key triggers in, in addition to the piece about incentive structures. But I think incentive structures are huge. And, and family networks, right? If you know that there's a family member, some kin network that is somehow benefiting from it, I think that's another obvious trigger. Oh, yeah, I think so. And that's, um, that, I think, has to do with gossip has a really important function. <laughs> <laughs> and um, part of what gossip does is um, it communicates information about your values in a way that has plausible deniability. So I'll give you a really simple example. If we're having a conversation about Angelina Jolie and um, you know, Jennifer Aniston, and I say, oh, you know, Jennifer really got screwed, I'm communicating to you that I'm not a cheater, but I don't have to tell you that I'm not a cheater. And if you tell me, oh, you know, Brad Pitt, he, had a, he was really a great guy, he got a great deal, you're telling me you're a cheater. But you're not, you don't have to say you're a cheater. But you're communicating very important information. But then if I say, gee, are you, you know, did you cheat on your wife? You go, no, I'm talking about Brad Pitt. I'm not talking about me, right? But that information gets conveyed. And that's part of what gossip does. It says, gee, I would never violate the ethics of the scientific process, but you know, he would. Um, and I think that there's ways in which gossip functions to produce exactly that kind of information. So when you come out publicly and you say, I wouldn't engage in this kind of behavior, you know, I wouldn't do what Steeple did, I wouldn't engage in academic fraud, then I'm saying I wouldn't do that. Whereas somebody says, well, gee, you know, I can understand why I do it. There's a lot of pressures in the academic system. You go, wow, you know? That person, that's really interesting. I once, it, uh, it's a very famous case, so I'll, I'm not gonna name it, but I once had somebody, only time in my life, accuse me of academic fraud, of making up some data. And one of my co-authors said, you have to respond to this person, he's so important, it's really great, you really need to respond to this person. I, I wrote back to my co-author and I said, the only person who would accuse me of that is somebody who engaged in academic fraud themselves. No, 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 no. And it turned out a year later that person was fired for academic fraud. And to his credit, my co-author wrote to me and said, you were right, and I never would have seen it. But the reason I saw it is because I knew what act <laughs> the function of gossip, right? So, I'm out of time. <laughs> Just one quick question. Oh, yes. I had a child society with the event biology. So are you suggesting, or actually most of, from what I heard today, are we trying to impose a higher level standard of ethics to the scientists than to the rest of the world, including lawyers, politicians, and journalists? Um, 
I think everybody should have the, the same standard. I just don't think that they do. Um, so um, I think that it's important to have a high standard. I don't think we should be a drive to the bottom, like, gee, I want to be as you know, down and dirty as a lawyer um, or you know, a politician or whatever it is at the bottom. I think that we should try to raise the integrity and the ethics of groups like you know, God forbid, members of Congress or, you know, lawyers or, you know, people in the media um, and, and, you know, raise up publicly the value of those who do it well. I mean, there are great science writers. Um, put them up as a model, not the people who do it, you know, negatively. And we could do that, you know, similarly with lawyers and other people who are, you know, doing amazing work in public service. Thank you. Thank you.